Well, I've said quite enough, I think, to give you an idea of Plato's ethics. Now let us turn in conclusion to the famous politics that he bases on it. And the first thing to note is that the three parts of the soul are not present in equal amounts in each person. Each man, says Plato, has a certain amount of each, but they're not equally developed in all men. The reason being that every person is simply an image or reflection of the form of man. And there are variations among the images, as there are among any reflections. Some reflect better than others. Some are more distorted by this worldly influences, more mixed with non-being. And therefore, in those people, the lower elements will be stronger. In general, we will expect, with maybe some intermediate cases, to find three general classes of men, three general types. The men in whom reason is the dominant element, and that is the philosophers. The men in whom the spirited is the dominant element, and that is the soldiers, the warriors, the military class. And the men in whom the appetites are most developed, and that is the masses in their economic capacity. Business and, and uh, uh, labor, producers and workers. Now Plato says that the, these distinctions among men are innate, and he tells another myth, famous myth of the metals, to illustrate. He says, imagine, for instance, that some men are born with gold in their souls. That's the philosophers. And some men are born with silver in their soul. That's the military. And some men are born with iron and brass in their souls, and that is the economic people, the majority. That's the way it is. There are these three types of men, innately so determined, by the kind of spiritual metal that makes them up. Now notice, this is not necessarily hereditary. You might be a gold soul, and your children might be iron and brass. Plato does not hold that it's hereditary, but it is innate or con the other way around, too. You could be uh, brass and have come from a gold or a silver parent. Now, the question of politics for Plato is who should rule? To which group should we give control? Should we give it to the men in the cave? To the men who are dominated by their appetites or by the spirited element? Well, obviously not. We then simply have chaos. The group that has to receive ruling power in the state is the philosophers, because they are the only men of reason, the only ones who know the form of the good, the only ones who know what's right and how to act, the only truly just men, the only ones whose souls are healthy. All the other men are in varying degrees inherently irrational, unjust, blind, bestial. There is therefore an exact parallel for Plato between the individual soul and the state as a whole. When the lower parts dominate the individual soul, we have a rampaging sophist on a spree of self-destruction. Well, when the lower parts dominate the state, the same thing happens. And therefore, Plato is an avowed explicit opponent of democracy or of majority rule of any kind or for any purpose. His view is, just as reason has to rule in the soul, so the men of reason, the philosophers, have to rule in the state. And just as reason must have unlimited power in the soul, it must be the absolute ruler, so the philosophers must have unlimited power in the state, they must be the absolute ruler. Philosophers, in a word, must be kings absolute kings. And this, of course, is Plato's famous theory of the philosopher king. We will have harmony in our life, uh, lives on earth, says Plato, only when philosophers assume total power, platonic philosophers, of course, or else when some person who already has absolute power, some king, is converted to Platonism. That's the only choice, is the only way to have sanity on earth. And Plato actually, in his own life, tried to convert one such king to Platonism with conspicuous lack of results. <laughs>
After all, says Plato, why should we allow the masses any voice in ruling the country? Ruling is a specialized art. Think of it. The government is to have complete control over the fine arts, sciences, industries, foreign policies, you name it. Now how can we open this up to untrained, uneducated, ignorant masses? Imagine what would happen if uh, we arrived at the design of buildings in architecture by majority vote. Well, says Plato, exactly the same thing would happen if we run the state by majority vote. Virtue is knowledge. The masses don't have the virtue, don't have the knowledge, and therefore can't conduct themselves virtuously. And the other half of virtue is knowledge answers the question, but is it safe to trust philosophers with such absolute power? Oh yes, because they have absolute knowledge and therefore they cannot misuse their power. They must act correctly since knowledge guarantees virtue. So uh, it's all set. Uh, by the time you get to politics, the moral to draw is you cannot argue with any philosopher. If you have accepted his conclusions in metaphysics and epistemology, by the time you get to politics, he just takes you by the hand and leads you wherever he's going, and you cannot open your mouth. The moral to draw being that it is hopeless to argue politics with someone unless you first argue metaphysics and epistemology. And once you argue metaphysics and epistemology, you would be amazed that political disagreements fall into place within minutes. Now, you might object to Plato and say, well, why have rulers at all, in the sense he means? He simply plunges in and says, who should rule? You might say, well, why not let each man rule his own life by his own reason, and have the function of the state solely to protect the individual rights of each citizen from violation by force and fraud? Now, in part, the answer is that the concept, the very concept of inalienable individual rights that uh, in here in man qua man had not yet been discovered. That is a post-Aristotelian discovery. But there's a much more important answer. Even if it had been discovered, Plato would have rejected it. Because in his view, it is impossible for most men to live their own lives rationally. They are in the cave, dominated by their appetites. They are savage barbarians at heart. Therefore, any kind of stability is possible only if there is a strong government ruled by the elite in whom reason is the most powerful element. Now you see the progression. One, this world is unreal. True knowledge is otherworldly. That's called rational. Plato's a rationalist, you see. Two, most men are this worldly. They're incapable of a mystic vision. Conclusion. Most men are incurably irrational, helpless to live by themselves. Therefore, we need a rule by an authoritarian few who have specialized knowledge. Here, the law I mentioned earlier, mysticism leads to dictatorship. Irrationalism leads to statism. We have, therefore, a three-class society, exactly parallel to the individual soul. The philosophers Plato calls the guardians, because they are the guardians of the state. And they perform all the legislative and judicial functions. And when they, per, when they are properly in charge, the state as a whole has the virtue of wisdom. The uh, military performs the executive functions. Plato calls them the auxiliaries, the assistants, you see, or helpers to the guardians. And when they have properly perform their functions, the state as a whole has virtue number two, courage. And the masses, of course, are the third class, the economic productive class. And their primary virtue is temperance, which in this context means obedience. And when the three classes are pro appropriately following their proper functions, the state as a whole will have the right division of labor and the right harmony, and that will therefore be the virtue of justice. Now I say again, for, out of fairness to Plato, this is not a caste society. In other words, you're not necessarily in the same class as your father. He may have been a philosopher and you're going to have to be a worker or vice versa, up and down the scale. And Plato has a whole series of um, tests worked out and a whole educational program 
to pick out at the appropriate age who is really in which class and shunt him up and down the social scale accordingly. Now, if you're worried about philosophers abusing their absolute power, uh, Plato's answer is in part what I alluded to, virtue is knowledge. Since these philosophers know the good, they have lost interest in everything that could possibly tempt them to abuse their power. They don't want money, fame, anything of that sort. They want only wisdom. But, says Plato, just to make assurance doubly sure that the guardians don't misuse their power, we are going to deprive them of all private property, as we have already mentioned. And therefore, they couldn't be motivated by money because they're not allowed to have any money, and so all temptation is removed from their path. Now, suppose that we had constructed such a platonic state. Observe uh, what we have. We have, in effect, a huge human being, like a single giant organism. We have a whole entity unto itself, with all the parts of an individual human being, but blown now into huge proportions. Each of the three classes you see corresponding to the three parts, and all together functioning as one entity. This view is known as the organic theory of the state. The view that uh, the state collectively is a separate and in in distinct organism, uh, and that the individual has the same relation to the state that a cell on the body has to the body. And it is therefore a particularly virulent form of collectivism. It was originated by Plato. How does it relate to his metaphysics? Well, you should be able to see that point. According to Plato, individuality is not real. All that's real is universals. And as far as men are concerned, individual men, insofar as they are individual, are unreal. What is real about them is only the thing they all are the same in, and that is madness. The appearance of a whole bunch of different men, remember, simply is in the images. They are not really, metaphysically, there are not separate autonomous individuals. We are, all of us, simply varying reflections of one entity, and we are therefore all ultimately metaphysically identical. In a word, the unit of reality and the unit of importance is the group, the state, not the individual. In metaphysics, universals are real, particulars are illusory, which means in politics, the collective is real, the individual is illusory. This is the philosophic basis of collectivism in politics. Collectivism being the view, full collectivism being the view that the group is the unit of reality and of value. And this, by the way, is one reason among dozens why the most crucial question in philosophy is the problem of universals. What is your political obligation, then, according to Plato? As a citizen, what is your obligation? To recognize your identity with all other men and act accordingly. And what is the arch of vice you can uh, embody? To treat your te yourself as an autonomous, self-sufficient entity living for your own happiness. You must live for the welfare of the state as a whole. Now again, I point out, as a Greek, Plato is not exclusively an altruist. He did say that you can legitimately be concerned with your own happiness also on the side, in effect. And he did say that in his state, that will not only produce the collective happiness, but also your individual happiness. But those are concessions to the prevailing Greek viewpoint and not characteristic of Plato. Qua Platonist as against qua Greek, Plato is an active, ardent state worshiper, an advocate of the view that individuals should live to serve the state and should systematically sacrifice themselves in their personal happiness. Quote, excessive love of self is the greatest of all evils, unquote. What is the ideal? Well, I'm quoting now from his very last dialogue, The Laws. The ideal is, quote, that the private and individual be altogether banished from life. 
and that things which are by nature private, such as eyes and ears and hands, become common." Unquote. What is Plato's attitude toward private property, private concerns, the kind of person who will say, this is mine, that is thine, yours? The kind of person who is so concerned to establish ownership. Who owns this? Whose is it? Quote from the Republic. Disunion comes about when the words mine and not mine, another's and not another's, are not applied to the same things throughout the community. The best ordered state will be the one in which the largest number of persons use these terms in the same sense and which accordingly most nearly resembles a single person. When one of us hurts his finger, the whole extent of those bodily connections which are gathered up in the soul and unified is made aware and it all shares as a whole in the pain of the suffering part. And hence we say that not only the finger but the man has a pain. The same thing is true of the pain or pleasure felt when any other part of the person suffers or is relieved. Yes says the other speaker in this dialogue, I agree that the best organized community comes nearest to that condition. In our community then, above all others, when things go well or ill with any individual, everyone will use that word mine in the same sense and say that all is going well or ill with him and his. People will not rend the community asunder by each applying that word mind to different things and dragging off whatever he can get for himself into a private home where he will have his separate family forming a center of exclusive joys and sorrows. Rather, people will all, so far as may be, feel together and aim at the same ends." Unquote. Now that, of course, is a formal and explicit advocacy of the exact view of man and of society that Ayn Rand dramatizes in Anthem. And that is therefore hardly an extreme projection, that is a dramatization of Plato's political ideal. And not only of Plato's, of course, all collectivists thereafter. The ideal is for men to form one unit with all goods in common. And in this respect, Plato is the father of communism. And it is instructive to observe that he is the father of Western religion and the father of Western communism. And that both of those are beautifully integrated in his philosophy to form one coherent whole. Uh, a very helpful thought when you observe that the two branches of descendants today pose as warring antagonists. I should mention that Plato, however, regarded communism as the ideal, but as impractical applied to the masses, because their appetites are simply too strong they wouldn't stand for it. They have to have their own little families and private property and so on, and Plato said we may as well, in effect, appease them because it's useless to try to get them to live the ideal life. Nevertheless, the true philosophers live that way, according to Plato. As we've seen, they have all property in common, and Plato insists they must have all wives and children in common also, which will not bother them, because as true philosophers, they're not interested in sex anyway. <laughs> and uh, says Plato, this will also help to remove any conceivable temptation from their paths, because uh, there's no longer the possibility that they will be ambitious for their children. Their wives and children will be taken, uh, yes, taken away at birth, the children will be taken away at birth, and uh, will be brought up and supervised, educated by the state. Plato also adds that there will be yearly mating festivals among the philosophers, and that uh, although um, the lower philosophers will be told that this is taking place simply by lot, that the partner you get is simply your good or bad luck. The actual truth is that the oldest, most senior philosophers will have studied the eugenic construction of the philosophers and will mate the ones that are eugenically best to produce uh, the highest breed. And the others will just, in effect, have bad luck at the lots. <laughs> 
Now you ask the question, well, won't the guardians, the philosophers, be unhappy living in this life, living this manner of life? And uh, Plato says in answer to that, quote, our aim in founding the commonwealth was not to make any one class specially happy, but to secure the greatest possible happiness for the community as a whole. We are not trying to secure the well-being of a select few. It is as if we were coloring a statue. You understand, in Greece, they tinted the statues. And someone came up and blamed us for not putting the most beautiful colors on the noblest parts of the figure. The eyes, for instance, he says, should be painted crimson, but we had made them black. We should think it a fair answer to say, really, you must not expect us to paint eyes so handsome as not to look like eyes at all. This applies to all the parts. The question is whether by giving each its proper color, we make the whole beautiful. So too in the present case. You must not press us to endow our guardians with a happiness that will make them anything rather than guardians." Unquote. You see the complete collectivism of the Platonic mentality. Individuals are simply unimportant. What counts is the group. And the group is something over and above the individuals. It can be happy even if all the constituents are miserable. Madness is getting its whatever it's to get deserves, uh, even if men are miserable. So we have a giant organism with the men of reason living communistically, ruling over the lowest class, the lower classes assisted by the spirited auxiliaries, everybody as much as possible being systematically inculcated by the desire to serve the state and obey the rulers. Which brings us to the question, what are the functions of the guardians? What areas of, this, of man's life are they to control? Everything. Uh, Plato's theory is total. And if you make an adjective of that, you get totalitarian. He modeled himself on uh, Sparta, which was completely statist and heavily admired by Plato. Education, says Plato, must be thoroughly controlled by the state. We must have a thoroughgoing censorship of literature, music, philosophy, science. We will allow people to hear only those ideas that are good for them, as judged, of course, by the authorities, the philosophers. We will tell people lies, so-called noble lies. That is to say, lies that are for the good of the people, as and when it turns out to be necessary. In other words, we're going to engage in out-and-out -out brainwashing. And there's no objection to this because the masses' reason is simply so weak that they won't respond to arguments. And so we have to simply condition people emotionally to blind obedience. As one unsympathetic but act, uh, accurate commentator says, describing this point, quote, it is pointless, for instance, to try to explain to the masses the organic nature of the state and the corresponding need of each individual to subordinate his immediate interest to the whole, for they cannot grasp such abstract concepts. But loyalty and patriotism are attitudes of mind easily inculcated, and they serve the same purpose of producing social cohesion, self-sacrifice, obedience to command, etc. Flag-waving, patriotic music, and tales about heroic forefathers must therefore occupy a large part of the school curriculum. It is quite beside the point if the tales told the children are untrue, provided they are thus inspired to conduct which is best for the state. I can't resist interjecting, of course, the blatant parallel between this and Nazism among dozens of other movements. And the commentator continues, and if on the one hand we see to it that certain things are taught, we must be equally careful to see that other things are not taught. Since the whole basis of this education is an appeal to emotion rather than intellect, it is of vital importance that the wrong sorts of emotion and desire, fear, for instance, or greed, are not stirred, that good emotions are not associated with the wrong sorts of objects, loyalty to one's family or class, for instance, instead of loyalty to the rulers as the symbol of the state as a whole. Thus, in Plato's state, the Ministry of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment and its complement, the Ministry of Censorship, are of the first importance." Unquote. And so they are. Needless to say, all careers are to be controlled completely. Vocational tests will be given out, uh, which uh, the 
board of philosophers assigned to vocational guidance will determine your ability and assign you to the job where you best fit the state, regardless of your desires. And if you say, uh, well, I object, what about my own happiness? I don't want to do this particular work. They will say, look, you are a cell of the body of society. Suppose a man had to walk through mud to reach his goal, and his foot could speak and said to him, I don't want to get dirty. <laughs> You'd say, you're a foot. <laughs> and if necessary, you'll get dirty or get cut off. And the same applies to an individual in relation to the state. There will, of course, be economic controls. Extremes of wealth have to be controlled, said Plato. We can't have poverty and we can't have extreme wealth. In general, it's a complete totalitarianism. In the laws in particular, his last dialogue, he works out the details of totalitarianism thoroughly, with detailed laws covering everything, from the banishment of atheists to the uh, detailed rules of trading various types of commodity, etc., he has the whole pattern worked out in exhaustive detail. It is, by the way, not a popular dialogue among Platonists because it is simply blatantly totalitarian. They like the Republic better, which is earlier and a little woozier, but not much. <laughs> now, Plato's philosophy on this, these uh, questions have been the blueprint, has been the blueprint ever since for dictatorial, totalitarian schemes of every variety. He is the rock underlying and making possible and constantly appealed to by the medieval theocrats and the defenders of the absolute monarchies in the early modern world and the communists and the fascists and the Nazis. And therefore, I suggest that sometime or other you read The Republic, where it's clearly outlined and very easy to follow. Now it's common on the part of people who don't uh, like totalitarianism, but uh, who accept entirely the basic ethics and metaphysics of Plato. In other words, they accept the altruist collectivist viewpoint, but don't like complete totalitarianism. It's common of them immediately to say it won't work. We shouldn't have uh, this kind of society. It would be good, but it wouldn't work. And of course, it's true, it wouldn't work. But the reason it wouldn't work is because of the ethics and the metaphysics underlying it. It's based on an anti-life, otherworldly ethics. And of course, life on Earth is impossible under such a system, and no such system will work. But you cannot combat it by simply saying it wouldn't work, not if you accept the foundations from which it comes. And I'll go you one better. You might be surprised to know that Plato was the first one who said it wouldn't work. <laughs> and he even gave an explanation why it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work, he said, because after all, my whole political philosophy is theory. And what's good in theory doesn't necessarily work in practice. He originated that one, too. <laughs> and that one follows directly from his metaphysics. Because when we theorize, what are we focusing on? The world of forms. When we practice, when we act, what world are we in? This physical, imperfect, transitory, appetitive, sensory world. Well, we couldn't expect then that all our theories are going to work perfectly down here in this world. In fact, we have to expect they wouldn't work very well because of all the non-being and contradictions and imperfection in this world. And therefore, there has to be a dichotomy between theory and practice. And therefore, the people who say it's good in theory but it won't work in practice are thoroughgoing Platonists, even if they never heard of universals. Now, of course, that dichotomy between theory and practice has had its own devastating effect. It's led to two kinds of men. The uh, uh, self-declared practical, who despise theory and the intellect, and uh, the self-declared theoretical, who uh, despise uh, practice and uh, the physical world and float free in their own dream dimensions of constructs. Both types sever the intellect, sever thought from life. And that is a fundamental platonic contribution. <laughs>
Even so, Plato says, even though my theory won't work perfectly, it's better than any alternative we have, and therefore let's do it. I should say that he grew progressively more pessimistic about it as he grew older, but he never abandoned it. Now, of course, the truth is that it would not work in practice because the theory on which it's based is defective, opposed to reality. But for that, you need a different metaphysics and epistemology. Now, I want, in conclusion, to point out to you a fundamental similarity between two schools which, on the face of it, superficially seem to be the exact opposite. Plato and the Sophists, who have fought each other since from Greece till today. Observe the similarity. The subjective skeptic side says, we have no standard to resolve disputes among men. The only thing we can resort to in human relations is force. We must become tyrants in politics. The Platonic mystic says, truth is accessible only to a privileged few. The mass of men are irrational and need to be dictated to. We have to resort to force in dealing with them. We must have a politics of tyranny. The sophists say, to hell with theory. We scorn it. Let us feel and kill. Plato says, the intellect will take you only so far, and then let's have a vision and kill. Now the friends of Plato say this is unfair. After all, they say the sophists are tyrants in the name of selfishness, whereas the Platonic philosophers dictate in the name of the unselfish welfare of the masses. One kills, if he does, for personal selfish pleasure, whereas the other kills altruistically for the happiness of society. Now, I don't propose to bargain about this question. You are dead either way. <laughs> Which brings us to the final question this evening. What about the possibility of a philosophy that would provide the foundation for a third alternative? A philosophy that would say there is one objective reality, this one, that all men can know it by the use of their senses and their reason, that neither subjectivist skepticism nor otherworldly mysticism is true, and thus lay the groundwork for an ethics of man's rational happiness on earth and a politics of individualism and freedom. What about it? Was there one? Yes. And that we will do when we turn to Aristotle. Thank you. Didn't Plato even consider what would happen uh, to his ideal state if two philosopher kings disagreed? Well, of course, he would say there could be no such thing. Uh, two philosopher kings properly trained, etc., since they're all being guided by the one world of forms, will have to end up, uh, when they have the ultimate vision, with the same vision, since there's only one form of the good, and therefore there's no possibility of disagreement, he would say. Did Plato have any checks against the spirited element, uh, the military misusing its power? Well, the check has the nature of the system. A man is allowed into the spirited class, into the military class, only after a exhaustive education, drumming into him the necessity of absolute obedience to the philosophers, and b only after passing tests of character to prove that he is a silver man. Did Plato have any check against the uh, spirited element manifesting itself in the guardians? Only the ones I mentioned. Thorough education, complete absence of property, complete absence of private family, mystic insight. But he granted that the guardians are imperfect along with everybody else. And therefore, that was in effect the reason why he wasn't so sure it would work. But uh, he said, uh, what can you do when you deal with people? Duty seems very important in Plato because the guardians are supposed to leave their beautiful world of sunlight in order to come down to the cave. Where did the concept of duty originate? It did not originate with Plato. It is implicit in Plato because it is implicit in any ethics which advocates self-sacrifice. But to have a formal ethics which declares 
right and wrong is explicitly a matter of duty, means to have a formal ethics which declares that happiness is irrelevant to ethics of any kind, your happiness or anybody's happiness, and that you simply must blindly obey certain rules because they have been laid down, period. Now, Plato is not that corrupt. It is implicit, but it's contradicted by his pro-happiness Greek side. The earliest formulations in the West of something approaching a duty morality are in the post-Aristotelian Stoics, who came close to a duty morality. The more religious Christians who said that duty was a matter of allegiance to God's commandments, no matter what, but even those schools are not really duty schools in the full sense, because the Stoics said you would achieve happiness if you did your duty, and the Christians said you would achieve otherworldly happiness in heaven if you did your duty. And therefore, it is not until Kant that duty became the central ruling concept in philosophy. Kant launched an all-out polemic against happiness as such, which he considered a despicably low state in relation to morality. Uh, uh, and it's only from that time that duty has become the central concept. In that sense, he took what was beneath the surface in Plato, the Stoics, and Christianity, and what had sometimes emerged into the surface and blew it up into a gigantic, full-fledged, explicit uh, system of morality.